Thank you, Edgar, and thank you to the organizers <coughs> for inviting me down today. Um, I want to take a, a little bit, uh, a step down in scale and also make reference to something that was referred to this morning about institutional, the importance of, of, of institutions. But also one word that hasn't really come up here at all, and that is poverty. And this is, it's very hard to summarize a two-year research project in, in 10 minutes, but, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and, but at the end, you'll see uh, a website where you can actually download the book uh, for the time being in Spanish, but we're still working on the English translation. But this is, this is essentially um, a very interesting experience of a municipality that has done a lot of the wrong things in some people's views. It hasn't privatized its key institutions. It has worked towards redressing social imbalances and inequalities. It has worked very hard to, to reduce violence. Um, and this is Medellin. Medellin has a really bad reputation in the world and it's associated with drug barons like Pablo Escobar and so on. But I can tell you that this experience uh, has been quite interesting for me as a researcher looking at to what extent a municipality and a local government can actually use resources that it has and more to try and reduce exclusion and poverty. And um, I will not really focus much on the um, uh, well, inevitably, I will focus on the technology, and this is the technology I'm talking about. It is a very simple ski lift technology, um, which exists anywhere, and with a recession in Europe, uh, producers of ski lift um, systems are really looking to sell these things, so they'll be really happy about this thing. Um, and it's been taking over more and more increasingly around the world in, in cities like Rio de Janeiro, uh, Constantine in Algeria, and of course, we now have in London, the Emirates airline. Um, what is interesting for me is, is these two lines, which are really the precursors of all the others. The one on the, li on the, on the left, um, line K, as they call it within the metro system in, in Medellin, was opened in 2004. And that really opened the floodgates to a whole new set of innovations about building these kind of transport systems, which are, I'll show you some figures about um, the costs, um, capital costs later. Um, but what interests me again is not these, the use of this technology, which um, in the, uh, the conference organizers call it the low technology uh, or low tech, but it's, it's how it's used imaginatively to try and reduce poverty and increase accessibility. Um, the one on the left is 2004, the one on the, on the right was opened in 2008. And a little bit um, of, of, of theory here, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. John Erie already referred to it, and he's actually, of course, written about these issues. But the issue of mobility is an important one. It's become a, an essential condition of a modern, modern contemporary life. You can only afford to be immobile in a city if you're very, very wealthy. If you are poor, you are subjected to even more poverty if you do not move, because you have to move to, to gain income, whether it's to go to a job or to sell the wares or to sell the, the fruits in the market or whatever it is that you do. So limited mobility constraints participation in urban life. This is only one dimension of uh, the theoretical elements of our, as I said, two year, two year long research project. This is a topography of Medellin, a city of three and a half million people, um, second largest in Colombia. Uh, blighted by um, not only issues of violence that I've talked about uh, and, and so on, but also informality. A large parts of the city uh, started life really as informal settlements, and they've been gradually illegalized. But this is the topography and the, if you like, um, typology that you would see typically in one uh, poor part of, of, of Medellin. It's quite vast and quite extensive. Medellin is a metropolitan area. I'm really referring here to the central municipality of Medellin, which has a population of about two and a half million, uh, and it's by far the richest of nine in the whole metropolitan area. The, and even more, I'm focusing on one of the two cases, the line K, which was on the left of your earlier picture, which is the Comunas 1 and 2, which were, were the, a lot of the violence that hit the international headlines um, um, came from, really. It, they're the, amongst the poorest, most conflictual parts of the city, 
Very important element is that um, a large proportion of the population who live there are actually tenants. This is something that people often forget. A lot of the technologies are addressed at the owners of houses, but we forget that enormous proportions of the populations, particularly in poor cities, are actually tenants. They do not have security of tenure. They can be evicted, whether it's uh, by the market or other means. And that's a quite an important element. The other one which these two pictures show is that most of these houses uh, where, they pe where the people live are actually self-built. They're built by themselves without any access to architects or engineers. Um, anyway, a, a little bit about the cable cars themselves. There are two built already um, which are urban and are designed to transport people from and to their places of residence to, to integrate them to the rest of the city. The first one, as I said, opened in 2004. It has a length of two kilometers. It uh, rises 400 meters from the, from the valley of the river, uh, where, where the river is, uh, up to the highest point. Uh, it has three stations, 3,000 passengers an hour, which is about the maximum that you can get out of a system like this. Anything more than that becomes much more expensive, I'm told by the, by the um, engineers. Um, the, the second one opened in 2008. It serves also poor communities. It's slightly longer. It, um, it also has three stations, and it's also linked to the, to the metro system, which is essentially an overground metro system. The metro system is entirely owned by the municipality, 50% uh, sorry, by municipality and the province uh, in, in, in sort of equal parts. And the two lines that you see there, uh, I don't have a pointer, uh, the one at the top, uh, Santo Domingo, and the one at the bottom in yellow, La Aurora, those are the two uh, cable cars, the metro, line, the metro cables. And this is the landscape that you see on um, line K on the left. The city has also built a number of uh, very important landmarks, including this library, uh, Biblioteca España, um, and, and other um, upgrading, which I will show you, but also has linked it to a tourist line which takes tourists up to the top of the hill, about a thousand meters above the, the, the bottom of the valley, to a lovely natural park. Important, and this is the, the main message I think that I want to, to provide, is that uh, in addition to the cable car itself, there's been very major efforts at upgrading of these informal settlements, and this is crucial. When mayors see this and say, well, this is a solution to all my problems, I would say no. The solution to all your problems uh, is not through technology, as John Ari was saying earlier, but it is about a much more inclusive, a much larger kind of intervention, which is what Medellin did quite well, including housing upgrading, upgrading our public spaces. So if the investment in the technology itself is dwarfed by the investment in upgrading. So if we take, depending on what exchange rate, you take 24 million was what we calculated, the, or the metro company calculated cost uh, to build the first one in capital investment. But $225 million uh, had actually been invested in urban upgrading. There have been a number of um, improvements which I'm not going to go through. You can sort of look at those in, uh, at your leisure in the book. Um, I was also asked to compare costs with other systems. It's, it's very difficult to find you know, reliable costs, but I'm doing my best here. The cable car, the first two cost about between 11 and $17 million per kilometer. The one in Caracas, which is slightly shorter than the, 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 the first one in Medellin, which was modeled after the Medellin one, um, cost $176 million per kilometer. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the reason is. It, it, it actually shifts less passengers per hour. That compared to Bogotá's um, Trans Transmilenio BRT phase one is, is slightly higher, but you have to adjust for, for inflation and so on, and maybe exchange rates. So it is comparable to the capital cost of building um, BRT. Um, and have they improved mobility? Yes, they're more convenient. Yes, they've saved people's time. Yes. Uh, but provided you discount the queuing time, which can be up to 45 minutes, which is a, a sign of the success of the system. Uh, they tend to be used mainly by cable car, by, by formal sector workers. It is less advantageous for people who want to combine this with other modes. It's, it's less advantageous for the young who are, who are in a focus group, and you'll be interested to see, to hear uh, preferred mobile phones if they, when asked which one would you give up 
they would say we would give up the cable car, but certainly not our mobile phones. Um, and lessons very quickly, very importantly, uh, Medellin has become a much more livable city from having the highest murder rate in the world. It's now well below that uh, and, and much better. But that was a, a, a very complex process of consensus building, which I'm not going to go into details of, of course, and it's very complex. Uh, it needed political imagination. The previous uh, speaker spoke about leadership. Yes, there was leadership from, from the point of view of the municipal um, government, and they've built these and escalators. Um, I'm, I'm run out of time. Um, but at the core of all this was also urban physical intervention, civic architecture, a lot of that learned from other cities, including Bogota. And last but not least, one important thing is that you need very strong local institutions. And Medellin is, is a model which has not really been studied, and that's one something that I've been really interested in for a long time. And at the core of it is the utility company, Empresas Públicas, which has assets uh, worth about US um, 10 billion. Uh, this is 2010 figures, so it's probably higher now. With a surplus of 877 million transferred to the city uh, to a municipality in between 2010 and 2011. And there's also the metro company. These are companies that are highly rated, entirely uh, state-owned or locally owned and highly rated by citizens. And the final thing that I want to say is that through these processes, what we found is that poverty was given enormous visibility uh, and the fact that, you know, visitors are coming to these areas, which were no-go areas even for the police at one point, has generated an enormous sense of collective self-esteem. So well beyond just the figures of investment is this last uh, sense that you, these people are feeling included in the whole, in the whole process. Um, this book, uh, you can download it from, from that. If you can uh, rapidly scribble down before it goes away. Uh, it's for free. It's already paid for by the British taxpayer, so why should we charge for it? Uh, the English version will come, I hope, in, in about a month's time. Thank you.